good. Uh, hey, Smiley. Hey. What's your Here name? Smiley. I recognize uh, you, but I can't place you. That's right. I uh, I would be Jeff Bennett, uh, Chief Operating Officer at Relogix. Chief Op, why do I recognize that name? I feel like I should know that name, but I can't remember why. Is that because you guys are the company that had a product and a service that all of a sudden became really relevant towards COVID? Yeah, we, um, uh, you know, so for those who don't know Relogix, uh, I'll, I'll make it brief, but we have uh, sensor technology and workplace analytics platform. So basically a data platform that that helps companies understand how space is being utilized. And pre-COVID, that was used for things like understanding if you have the right type of space for the type of work your employees do, or you have the right size portfolio for the type of work that you need, et cetera. And when COVID hit, um, it dawned on us fairly quickly, uh, probably within 24 hours of the first Canadian announcement, that, that we can actually use our data to provide to our existing customers the ability to manage the COVID pandemic from a protocol adherence perspective, which allows them to do a few things. Allows them to make sure that the right percentage of occupancy is happening, because there are some offices like banks and ins insurance companies where a lot of people still, not a lot, but a, a select number of people still have to come into the office. It identifies clustering of people. So where there are people on the floors, are they sitting side by side, are they close by, et cetera. And it also helps them so that if someone um, gets diagnosed with COVID, we can, we can tell you which seats were occupied at the same time as that person over kind of the whole um, contagious period. So that then our clients know who to contact. So, and then, and then with that, um, so we've, we've provided that free of charge to all of our customers. And uh, the response has been overwhelming, absolutely mind-bogglingly overwhelming and how just appreciative they were that we were able to do that so because between idea and delivery was about 72 hours oh wow so my team like we had an idea is one thing but when you have a, an amazing team that's smart way smarter than i am and uh they turned an idea into just absolute reality and our customers are just beside themselves happy with what we've done for them and now once then we're going to expand that to then talk about the back to work because when we kind of turn the corner on this the question is like work will never be the same right it just won't and so we're going to be helping people uh kind of um, adjust the working environment for things like ensuring that um uh when employees are in they're sitting at seats that are at least six feet away from each other or um, when you're in a meeting room that's 12 person and it's a six person meeting room that everyone's sitting in every other seat and those kind of things, right? But, but help companies kind of adjust the, the population density of their office space to meet um, the back to work, but also if wave two comes around, right? Because there might be several other waves of COVID, but smaller waves, hopefully. And they'll have to kind of recede and come back and recede and come back. So that's been pretty, that's been very well received. That's awesome. So when we, when we first met, well, not when we first met, we first met years ago, but when we first met in the context of Relogix, mm -hmm. I think you guys were maybe seven employees strong. Um, you were in a, a sublease. Yeah, we were 13. I was the 13th employee. 13. Okay. So 13 employees strong. You were in a sublease space. Yeah. Um, you've blown up to what, 30, 32? Yeah, just shy. 20, we're 28, 28 people. 28. Yeah. 28 people. And, um, uh, and it's been amazing. We've hired, well, actually, thanks to the help of, of uh, Pivot Edge, we've, we've hired, uh, you know, another 15 people since then, since you and I first met. So walk me through that whole, and thank you for the props, I'm not trying to make this about us, but the... No, but that's, well, that's why we found great people, so. Okay, so give us the props. Give me more <laughs> my head bigger. Um, so, you know, you've, you've been in lots of organizations. You've been a, a, a success coach. Um, you're a huge product guy. What was it like being on the inside in that rapidly scaling organization? And then sub question, um, you, you moved into that, that new office space, you've redone the office space. The office space is now totally uh, reinvented with your new branding, all the new yep. paint, all the new open space to now work from home. And it appears as though you're in your attic. Um, how, is, how have you and how has the team 
found that transition to, to work from home. So it's interesting, right? As we were growing the team, um, what, what we loved was that our culture was starting to come to the forefront, right? Like, you know, our culture, when I first started, you know, we had lots of smart people, mostly uh, in the development or technical fields, not, not a very noisy office to say the least. It was kind of um, quiet, really, in our office space. And then as we started to grow the team, we were hiring, uh, you know, more developers, of course. We had now people in the, on the business side of the equation, right? So uh, inside sales, sales, marketing. Um, and so the, just the personality mix started to really shift to more like a real company that has a mix of, of uh, departments. And it was amazing to just watch how the culture was percolating without say me or Andrew, right? Andrew's the CEO and founder, right? Like there's this culture percolating without us, even though we're obviously, we're part of it, of course, but there's just this, there's this uh, inertia that's happening that was really, really impressive. And then when we moved to our new office space and then we redesigned the office space, um, you know, it just became this place where, where everyone wanted to come to work, of course. And um, we always had, you know, fun days for, you know, there'd always be some excuse to have some kind of, you know, chili contest or, um, you know, we had cider Thursdays. We've had, you know, we've had all kinds of fun kind of team environments. But what's interesting too, is that when, when this occurs, um, when COVID occurred, it was very, it was very uh, disruptive in the sense that just as our culture was really taking off and it just, it just, there's so much uh, like a buzz. I don't know how to describe this, but like a hum in the office, right? All kinds of, and then when you disperse like that, it was, it was, it's not good, of course, because we like the hum, but what we started to do instead is that we started doing virtual team things. So we had a, a, a trivia night a couple of Thursdays ago. Oh, cool. And so now every Wednesday, I think it's every Wednesday, I think it's every second Thursday or Wednesday to my calendar. Um, we now have trivia night. So we hired a guy who, who facilitates and we all jump onto a zoom like this, all 28 of us and on our mobile devices, we have a, the trivia questions pop up. Oh, that's cool. And it's like this. So we do trivia nights as a team. Um, and of course we communicate, uh, as a team every week. And then we have, um, uh, and each of the departments are having, you know, scrums every day. So you had to really pick up the communication, but it, it, it certainly is not ideal, I guess, for your, you know, that, that inertia we have with our culture, it's not ideal to then start being in different locations. So sticking on the, the, the culture side of things, um, one thing that really stood out when I got to see the, the, the redesigned office was that you've named your boardrooms uh, after Phantom Power. What's that? Phantom Power and- yeah, different, different tragically hip albums. Right. Are there ever any big debates about what boardroom is best? Because I think the hit kind of peaked at Phantom Power. That's that's comes from someone who hasn't listened to all their albums, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Music at work? Come on, give me a break. There was like oh, three good songs. Well, how about um, you know? There's there's lots of, like um, uh, World Container. I would recommend that one if you haven't. Uh, oh, I've listened. A World Container is a great little album. Anyways, the point is that what's, what's funny is that, so Andrew, again, the CEO and founder, and I have known each other probably 10 or 12 years. So he hired me as a consultant and two companies ago from him. And what I didn't know or didn't discover about him until we were planning the new office redesign was that he too was a huge hip fan, which I didn't realize. And, and then it turns out he's been to like 12 concerts of the hip. I've been to probably eight or nine. Um, I have every CD they've ever made, so does he. And so we decided to put a bit of a theme through there. So when you walk into our front uh, lobby, as soon as you sit down, there's actually a, there's a silhouette of, of Gord Downey next to a, Canada, a Canadian flag. And then we decided to name two of the boardrooms um, off two of their albums, uh, Phantom Power. I should have fully completely with probably arguably their best album, but anyways. And uh, um, so there's a theme, there's certainly a theme of Tragically Hip and, and given the, What's funny is that given the um, the uh, age diversity in our in our company, so we're a very diverse company, both in, in every way, but age is one of them. And our youngest employee would be probably 24, and our oldest would be probably 60, 61 in that range. And so it's fair to say that the very very 
young employees probably don't have the same appreciation for the hip as some of us older folks. But those kids, that's not even music that they listen to these days. What is that? <laughs> yeah, give me a break. Um, okay, so on on the topic of of young people, um, you uh, and I share a haircut. Yes. Um, now I think I think I have a few more seedlings remaining than you. Um, <laughs> I kind of feel that's because you have a, a much larger family than I do. You, you, you were the father of three, I don't want to call them young boys, but you are the father of three boys Yes. Uh, that are at various stages of their development. Yes. Um, I think you mentioned that one of them is off to university. Yeah, one of them is... Yeah, second year university at Queens, grade 12 and grade 11. I got to ask, what's your grocery bill these days? We spend, uh, especially we're, when we're all home and now all three boys are eating all day long, uh, we are easily spending about 500 bucks a week at Costco and probably another 100, 150 at the local grocery store here every single week Yeah, just to feed three monsters. And my wife and I just kind of, we, we walk around the table waiting for scraps to fall off the table so that we can eat as well. Well, I remember... <laughs> I remember when we first met. We, we went up for a coffee at a Starbucks years ago, mm-hmm. um, and I remember I didn't. I had your LinkedIn photo. I had your LinkedIn profile. Nowhere on that does it show your Muay Thai stats uh, or the tail of the tape. I was amazed that that you were. And I'm I'm six seven, about two forty. Uh, what are you? Six five? Six four? No, no, I'm six two. Six two two hundred. Your presence is much larger. That's right. Um, throughout this time, knowing that they're in growth period, like prime growth period if at least one of them doesn't turn into like a WWE wrestler, are you going to be disappointed? And your sons aren't going to see this. So it's okay to tell the truth. Well, you, you laugh, but uh, so I've been into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu for a very long time. So I teach train and compete and I actually turned the uh, unfinished side of my basement into, I, I bought mats off Amazon oh. and my oldest son has been doing Jiu Jitsu for quite a while. And my middle son, wanted to get into it but now with the COVID he said let's I'll get into it now so I've been teaching him every other day and then we do at least two or three times a week we try and get in each time we try and get in seven or eight rounds so we'll set the timer for five minutes yeah and we get to do rounds now what other time can a father choke out his kids like, there's, no, <laughs> there's, no, there's no better you know if only that I could have done that when they're even younger but at least now they're big. I mean, my middle son is at least my size, if not bigger. And then my, my oldest son is not quite as tall, but certainly quite, quite strong. So on, and, top of, uh, on top of being the COO, you're also uh, accounts receivable. Uh, um, well, actually, well, yes, for sure. Um, but uh, yeah, there's no, yeah, I'm that as well. Um, I would say Andrew's taking more of that role as of late, but but you could bill, you could collect bills if you had to. I could I could collect bills. The uh, I it's just I can't fly right. It's a no fly zone, so I can't fly anywhere. Okay. I didn't okay. collect the payment. Fortunately, we have customers that uh, are are paying us, so that's good. Okay, so on on to some finances, not in detail, but you guys had your Series A hit. What was that? July. End of August. Yeah. End of August. Um, I remember. Uh, certainly, there's a lot of excitement around Series A and injections of cash and all that kind of stuff. Um, I remember speaking with you and, and being at your office around that time and your approach uh, about, I was like, how, Hey, the money hit, how are you feeling? Mm-hmm. And your approach or, or your response was a bit surprising, but it totally makes sense. You mentioned something along the lines of when your series A hits, yes, there's, there's cause to celebrate, but it's also now a much more high pressure to de- deliver and, and perform environment. Um, Walk me through that mentality and, and, and how things have adjusted as a result. Yeah, well, one is that we have, um, we rolled out a company-wide scorecard. Um, that's not just at the company level, but also at each department level. So we have uh, done a few things to make sure everyone is clear that at the end of the day, the market doesn't care about us, right? They don't care about any company. Um, a company has to make the market care about you, right? You know, you can't just sit back and hope the, the window will always be open for you. So we take that very seriously and we take earning the right to, to grow our business. When I say earning the right is that we, mean, we need to earn the trust and confidence of our customers and earn the right of their business and earn the right to grow their business. And 
what we've done is that we, we've done a few things. One is to make sure that everyone is clear on the measures that matter, right? Bookings, MRR, monthly recurring revenue, um, development velocity, um, number of MQLs, marketing qualified leads, number of raw leads, number of website visits, number of proposals out the door, number of like, we, we track everything. And what we do is at the, the, the end of every quarter in the beginning of the, the subsequent quarter, we do a, a quarter retro, sorry, a quarterly retrospective and kickoff. So at the end of every, so the first week of the new quarter, we review what took place in the quarter before. We talk about our metrics, where do we hit, where do we fail, what are we doing about it, and then, and then every single department goes through what's called the VIPs. The VIP stands for victories, insights, and puzzles. So what were our victories? Victories are usually around our measures, right? Things that we did well. Successes, essentially, right? Uh, insights are things that what do we learn? Like, what do we discover? And puzzles are things that what have we yet to solve, right? And development goes through the same thing, marketing, sales, operations, the whole team, finance. And so what's great about those sessions is that it really instills a performance culture when there's such transparency about well, the measures that matter we're transparent when we succeed, we transparent, we're transparent when we fail, and we're transparent about what we're gonna do differently, where we failed, right? And um, I, think that's, I think that's made a pretty big difference on, on making sure that we're all clear on what we're trying to achieve. So we're, we're all gonna come out of this um, at some point, I'm sure. I, I really believe that we're gonna be better as people and, and better as community and better as companies. Um, one thing I'm really curious of, and, and I, I ask this of a lot of people, is what have you learned about yourself over the past month that has surprised you the most? Um, I would say, what's the best way? I'd call it creative resilience. So when, I forgot, I don't even know what day it is today. So March, whatever it was when, when the country decided it's time to shut down. Um, I know a lot of people that, uh, colleagues, friends, that kind of went in instantly into kind of panic mode, right? And in some cases that it was warranted. In other cases, it was just a knee jerk, right? And I remember just thinking that, and, and I've had many conversations with Andrew, our CEO and founder, is that, you know what, this, this is going to impact everyone in some degree of negative, negatively in some varying degrees, right? Some people it's gonna be just an absolute nightmare and other people it's gonna be variations thereof. And I just thought, you know what, every single time in history when there's been something this disruptive, the, what comes out of it tends to be this, this, this um, the world just tends to come on a different trajectory afterwards. And I, and I believe that to be true. And so, so when, we got on our first board call right after the announcement and the board was basically saying, okay, guys, you help people understand space. No one's in the office. So what's their life's going to be like. Right. And to get on that board call, we say, no, 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 here's what we're doing for our customers. We're actually going to take this as an opportunity to be helpful to our customers and give them the tools they need to, to, to manage this. Right. And the end of that board call, it was a completely different tone than the beginning of the board call. And the board was thrilled that we we're able to, to move so quickly, come up with an idea, execute on it, and get a customer validated in such a short period of time. And so I guess that's something, I don't know if that's learned about myself necessarily, because I know I'm pretty resilient to begin with, I guess, but I just think um, what I learned is that, man, if you, if you just think about what the opportunity is first, and then what's possible second, and then worry about your plan B third, right? Plan B is kind of the, the negative side of this stuff, right? And when you're surrounded, go back to my, the culture of the company, when you surround yourself with people that think similarly and they just execute like crazy to deliver something that was amazing, um, it made it all worth it. That's awesome. What's, uh, give us a plug for the website again. I know, I know you're looking for website visits, so help out your marketing uh, team. What's, yeah, what's your uh, website again? Relogics.com, R-E-L-O-G-I-X.com, Relogics. And is there truth to the rumor that I'm starting right now that anyone that buys new product from you in the next month gets to have a training session in your basement? That will work. And you may or may not choke them out. <laughs> I'd give that to anybody, for sure. 
That's a great deal. <laughs> Listen, I appreciate you taking the time. Be safe. I hope uh, I hope the kids don't eat everything um, because you're either going to get skinnier or run out of money. So you know. <laughs> I buy some Brussels spreads, buy stuff that is nearest that, 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 that they don't like, just out of self-preservation. Yeah, that's what I'll have to do, for sure. Good idea. Stay safe. Thanks. Be good. See ya.